In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. Therefore, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we note and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Now I know we went over this somewhat on Friday, but of course remember Friday we didn't get to record this. And there's a lot more details to this that I did not give you, some of which is probably review for you, but it's important for you to have this review because if you ever come into contact with an unbeliever and you need to witness to that unbeliever, I want you to write down all of these scriptures that I'm going to give you so that you can do it effectively and not just uh, be uh, ignorant when you give the gospel because it's important to know the gospel in order to uh, give it correctly and to know scripture in order to give it correctly. So uh, chapter 7 verse 13 says this, Enter through the narrow gate. This is a corrected translation from the Greek. Enter through the narrow gate. Now the narrow gate is salvation upon believing in Jesus Christ after hearing the gospel. It is narrow because there's only one way to enter through this gate. And also, uh, by a means of a little bit of application, this is also an appeal to Judas Iscariot and any other unbelievers who may have been found at this point uh, in the presence of Jesus while he was teaching on the mountain. Remember, he retired to the mountain along with his disciples, and inev inevitably some other people followed them as well, but uh, Judas Iscariot was there as well. And there are many illustrations of faith that is, non-meritorious actions, such as eating. The Bible always describes eating uh, when it's talking about faith. Now, of course, it has eating in the literal sense, but eating in the figurative sense is always talking about faith because uh, people like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Osama bin Laden, all of these people who are evil eat just the way we eat, and it's a grace function. They open their mouth, and the food and the, hits the epiglottis and the food then goes down into the stomach instead of into your lungs. So all of this is grace. And eating is a reference to grace. Drinking is a reference to grace. Opening the eyes is a reference to grace. Also, in a few places, it talks about buying gold. That's a reference to grace. And in this case, entering the narrow gate is a reference to grace. And because, and then uh, going on, because the gate is wide and the way is spacious, that leads to eternal destruction. And there are many who go through it. In fact, there's probably about uh, 4.7 billion people who today are entering through the spacious broad gate. And, and then continuing in 714, because the gate is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to eternal life. And there are few who find it. It's difficult for people because they become too arrogant and they take themselves, instead of taking themselves out of the equation, they put themselves into the equation. And it's difficult for a person who is an unbeliever, who is religious or who is legalistic to do nothing for salvation. They always want to do something for salvation. They always want to add works to it. And it's very difficult for them to let go and say, you know what, Jesus Christ did it all on the cross because they want to say, I have done something. But they are depraved. They are totally separated from God, totally helpless to do anything about it. They have no ability whatsoever to gain a relationship with God through their own human works, their own human talent, their own human ability. It's impossible. And that's the broad way of salvation. Completely different than what you might look at on the surface. You might see narrow and say, ooh, that means I have to be a good little boy. No, that's what everybody in the world's trying to do. They're trying to be a good person in order to gain favor with God, and that's religion. But remember, Christianity is not a religion. In Christianity, God seeks man through the work of Christ on the cross. In religion, 
Man seeks God through his own works. And it doesn't work that way. And that is the broad road to destruction, eternal destruction. So trying to be saved through your own good deeds and your own righteousnesses is the broad way that leads to destruction. Now this broad way is being followed by uh, many people today. It's even being followed by people in so-called Christendom. And you can go to a lot of churches. They call themselves Christians, but their way of salvation is not the narrow gate. They want you to work hard. They want you to be moral. And morality is for both believer and unbeliever. So we're going to get a list of all the different works that people use to try to get into heaven. And then we'll counter that with Scripture that deals with the true way of salvation. And the true way is the narrow gate, faith alone in Christ alone. And when we get to those verses, you should probably write them down because inevitably one day you'll come across either a religious person or a legalistic person or someone who simply wants the gospel and they've always thought they had to be good to be saved. And finally, you'll be able to have these scriptures at your fingertips. You probably might even want to memorize some of them. And if not, just keep a list handy for you whenever you get the opportunity to witness, as all of us do. But we must be prepared to witness and we must know scripture scripture in order to witness. So there are verbal works. First of all, one of the most claimed verbal works is pseudo-repentance. And that is a mistranslation, of course. It's not really a mistranslation because it, during the time of the 1500s and 1600s, the word repentance meant to change your mind. Only today have we confused that meaning to mean uh, feel sorry for your sins. So pseudo-repentance is wrongly or erroneous, erroneously construing repentance as feeling sorry for sin. However, we've noted the word metanoieo in the Greek, M-E-T-A-N-O-E-O, -E and that means to change your mind. So to repent is simply the result of common grace. In common grace, God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel perspicuous to you. And when it's perspicuous to you for the first time as an unbeliever, you've never understood it before, but you understand it now. And when it becomes perspicuous or understandable, uh, you change your mind about Christ, metanoieo. Before that, you didn't believe in him. Before that, anything dealing with Christ was foolish, foolishness. Before that, uh, you couldn't understand how someone could die on the cross as a substitute for you because God the Holy Spirit ne never made it understandable, acting as your human spirit. Because remember, when you are born into this world, you're spiritually dead, dichotomous, without a human spirit, without an ability to know spiritual matters, and therefore without an ability to know how to be saved. So God the Holy Spirit does it for the unbeliever. He did it for us when we were unbelievers. He does it for every unbeliever. And that just shows how helpless we are as unbelievers. We can't even believe on our own. We need God the Holy Spirit's help. And God, the Holy Spirit, actually helps us to understand the gospel. And then when we understand it, metanoieo is the result, change of mind about Christ. No longer is it foolishness. You understand it and you say, wow, I believe this now. I finally understand it, so I believe it. So change of mind is actually the first thing that occurs. And as a result, you believe in Christ. And when you believe in Christ, that becomes part of efficacious grace. And God, the Holy Spirit, makes effective Faith alone in Christ alone and nothing else. Nothing else. Scripture has never said anything else about being saved except to believe in Christ. Except to have faith alone in Christ alone. No other way. So today we've had uh, false doctrines arise. Such as invitation. Now invitation does have a right meaning. It also has a wrong meaning. Now salvation uh, by invitation. Well there are two different ways. Now, the right invitation is made by our Lord. And our Lord invites us to salvation. We never invite the Lord anywhere. Our Lord invites us. And this is found in Scripture in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me. That is Christ inviting us. We don't say, we don't say to Christ, Come unto me, Christ says to us, come unto me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now these words were uttered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this indicates that salvation is not something you labor for, nor should you be heavy laden with works. 
In other words, don't try to work your way into heaven. Now look what Christ says. All you that labor and are heavy laden. Who are those who labor and are heavy laden? The religious crowd, the legalistic crowd. They're always trying to work their way into heaven. They lay themselves with heavy burdens. They lay themselves, they put upon them their shoulders taboos that aren't even related to scripture. And they say, this is how I'm getting to heaven, by laboring this hard. But guess what Christ says? No, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. And when you understand that, when you understand that you no longer have to work for salvation, then finally you can rest. Before that, you were always working and working to get into heaven. Always working to try to prove to God that you could be just good enough. Yet you can never match the righteousness of God and all your righteousnesses are as minstrel rags. Isaiah 64, 6. So we can't work our way into heaven. And we do not invite Christ anywhere. He invites us. And it's very clear from Scripture. And the fact that many people get upset when they hear this is because their whole lives they've been taught differently. They've gone to churches where they don't know Scripture. They've gone to churches where the pastor just gets up and says anything that comes to the top of his head, usually by tradition, and usually copying the other pastors around the area, and he doesn't know enough to come in out of the rain because he never has took, an, took enough time to study, and even if he did study, he's not a man of grace, so he would just uh, fall all apart. He, you, to understand grace, you must be spirit-filled. To understand anything dealing with grace, you have to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And I tell you this, even though they don't study, they're too lazy, but if those pastors today were to sit down and study and beat their brains out for 16 hours a day, every day a week, they would never come to understand grace unless they were filled with God the Holy Spirit. You can't get it any other way. And they don't know how. They were never taught by their pastor how to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, isn't that a shame? Well, you know why they were never taught by their pastor not to be filled with God and the Holy Spirit? Because they didn't want it. Because we've studied in the past, if you were here, we have studied how anyone who wants Bible doctrine, God's going to open the door for them and give it to them. And I told you how people pulled out tapes out of a garbage can. And they, they didn't know what they were going to get. They just saw a tape there by grace, picked it up, put it in, and decided to order. And got it free of charge and kept on going and went on to spiritual maturity. Why? Because they wanted it. And if anybody wants it, God will provide it. So John 6.35, you might want to write this down as a reference for when people come to you not knowing what the gospel is all about or people especially who are unbelievers who are seeking an answer and they've always been told that all you have to do is be a good little boy or a good little girl and they come up to you and say how is it that I am saved I've had it happen to me before somebody calls me on the phone and they say uh, yes I would like to speak to Andy and then they talk to me and they say how is it that I am saved and they say I thought I just had to be good and then you can give them scripture because you know it. John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Notice, nothing there about invite. Who does the inviting, if anything? It's Christ. We don't. Now this is scripture. I do not deviate from scripture. So note that Jesus Christ is the one who invites us to salvation. We do not invite him. This is important to know in relation to the two gates because narrow is the gate and narrow is faith alone in Christ alone. If you add anything to it, if you add invitation to it on your part, you're going the broad way and the broad way leads to destruction. So this is important to know, and I know that I harp on it, but I do it for a very important reason. Because when you come into contact with some of your friends, as you most definitely will, and all they've ever heard is invite Christ into their heart, even though they may be well-meaning, and even though they were raised that way and they may seem to be pretty good fellows or pretty good girls, 
It doesn't matter. There's only one way of salvation. It's narrow. Faith alone in Christ alone. Nothing there about invite. And if all they've ever done is invite Christ into their heart, they're not saved. And it's tragic. That's the way they were taught. And maybe they need the straight gospel. And maybe you're the one who needs to say, Hey, look, believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Find me a verse that says, Invite Christ into your heart. It's not there. You need to simply believe. And if they're humble enough, They'll go check it out on their own and they'll say, you know what, and that dude's probably right. And then they may come to believe. Now it's possible that a pastor could get up and rattle off some verses such as John 3.16 and say during the closing message, uh, God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him may never perish but have eternal life. And he may say that, and at that point they may believe, and if they do, they're saved. But then at the end of it, he says, so now all of you come down to the altar and invite Christ into your heart. They may do that as well, but if they believed first, they're saved. But if they have the idea that going to the altar is the way of salvation, and if they have the idea that inviting Christ into their heart is the way of salvation, it doesn't work. It's narrow, remember. And Christ didn't say it was narrow for nothing. He said it's narrow. There's only one way. Only one way. And there's only one name under heaven by which man can be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's faith alone in Christ alone. John 6, 37. John 6, 37. The one that comes unto me I will certainly not cast out. Now, notice who does the inviting. Jesus Christ. Remember from the earlier verses, Jesus Christ invited us. And then what do we do? We come to him. How? How do we come to Christ? By faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And anyone who believes in Christ, I will certainly not cast out. This is a reference to eternal security. And when people tell you that you can lose your salvation, they're idiots. It's all through Scripture. And John 6, 37 is one of those. The one that comes unto me, I will certainly not cast out. You come to Christ by faith alone in Christ alone, and when you do so, you will not be cast out. What that is saying is no matter what you do after you're saved, no matter what a stinker you become, no matter how stupid you become, no matter what sins you commit, he will not cast you out. You're in his hands forever and forever. And of course, during your lifetime, you're going to come across people who say, don't listen to the doctrine of eternal security. Those are doctrines of evil. Those are doctrines of the demons. Well, those are people that don't know they've been bought. And they've been bought with a price. The price is what our Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. They've been purchased. And what Jesus Christ has purchased, he's not going to throw away and discard it. He purchased us, and we are royal family of God no matter how we act and no matter what we do. And you say, oh, that means I can do whatever I want. Well, go ahead, you'll be punished. And a lot of people say, well, goodbye, God, I'll see you in eternity. And then uh, what happens is they will see Jesus Christ in eternity, and they will be filled with shame, the greatest oxymoron ever. John 6, 47. John 6, 47. He who believes in me has eternal life. Now this is how you give the gospel. You refer them to scripture. You don't just make up some emotional feel-good statement that has been made up and followed by tradition. You don't simply just say, well, feel sorry for your sins and invite Christ into your heart. Why would they do that when it's not in scripture? And if they do that, they're not saved. Scripture makes it clear, he who believes in me has eternal life. And eternal life, by the way, goes on forever and ever. So this too is a reference to eternal security. You believe in Christ, you have eternal life. Is there an end to eternal? No! Idiots don't even know English language. Eternal! Forever! You are saved forever! Eternal! Well, I say it like that because so many people will say, oh no, uh, he can't be a believer and do that. That's not, no, he's not going to heaven acting like that. Well, he who believes in me has eternal life. That is, he who believes in Christ has eternal life. They have thick skulls. Well, they have hardness of heart. They're blind. And you could show them the verse. Look, it says eternal. Do you know what eternal means? 
It's like you're talking to a bunch of retards. Don't even know English language. Yet if they were to take a test, they'd probably match it up. Eternal means forever and ever. Yet when it comes to Scripture, they're blinded. There's a veil over their faces, and they can't see it because of legalism. So this is our Lord's invitation to the spiritually dead. Our Lord invites the spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead. We can't invite Christ anywhere. And when you're dead, you can't invite someone to a party. And when you're dead, you can't invite someone to go bowling. You're dead. You can't invite Christ anywhere. You can't invite anyone anywhere. But Christ invites us. And through God the Holy Spirit and the grace of common grace in which he makes it understandable to the unbeliever, you can come to a change of mind and believe in Christ. The spiritually dead person can hear and believe. But only God the Holy Spirit can make the gospel understandable and make faith effective. So remember, even when you believe you're not doing anything, God the Holy Spirit's doing all the work. You just believe. And you're believing because you finally understand it. And when you believe, if God the Holy Spirit didn't make believe effective, you wouldn't be saved. But God the Holy Spirit does make it effective. So that's how it comes down to the point that we do nothing. It's a non-meritorious act of believing. Just as when you're in school, the teacher says one plus one equals two, you say, yes, ma'am, one plus one equals two, and you write it down on a test. Now, if you were to be rebellious about it and say, no, one plus one equals five, you're going to fail. So it's a matter of faith. Even the vocabulary we speak, we accept on the basis of faith, a system of perception that really has no merit attached to it whatsoever. So the wrong invitation can be divided into two categories. First of all, there's inviting Christ into your heart. That's very prominent. That's wrong. That's not in Scripture. We don't do that. Then there's inviting Christ into your life. As you see what happened? Some of the pastors said, well, you know, it doesn't say anywhere invite Christ into your heart. So we'll just say invite Christ into your life. And both are wrong. So I've received this question countless times, uh, mainly from the, the young people. And the young people uh, seem to be, at times, uh, be, they seem to be more interested in the Word of God than some of us old farts. Because I remember, uh, well, just last week, uh, no one was here except a young fellow. And I told him, I said, well, nobody's here, and uh, I would really like them to get this, what I'm about to teach next. Uh, maybe we'll just cancel tonight and go for tomorrow night. And he piped up and said, No! I want to listen to the Word of God! So I said, So I felt convicted and said, All right, well, let's go sit our butts down and listen to the Word of God. And that young man has shown more interest in the Word of God than uh, many other people. And uh, he might surpass you one day if he's not getting close already just by the, well, the attitude. It takes a mental attitude. And the attitude says, I want the Word of God. Now, he could have said, hey, let's play risk, man. <laughs> no, he said, I want to sit down and listen to the Word of God. And hopefully it sticks that way so that we can at least get to one person in a younger generation to go to maturity. <clears throat> but what he was asking, or what this young man asked me many times is, you know what? Every church I've been to, he told me this. He said, you know what? Every church I've been to, they've said, invite Christ into your heart. And then you come along and say it's not in Scripture, and it's definitely not in Scripture. Why do they do that? Well, there is... Uh, well, this is kind of an answer. Uh, some of them do it because of Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 through 20, and their misunderstanding of it. And they misapply Revelation chapter 3, 19 through 20, which is addressed to believers only. And yet uh, they confuse this and make it apply to the believer. And so this is where they most likely originated with invite Christ into your heart. But uh, more than likely, it's just a satanic counterfeit. And we will study in the next hour about all the satanic counterfeits to everything, from the gospel to doctrine to communion to everything else. So Revelation 3, 19 through 20 says this, Those whom I love, I reprimand. Now this is warning discipline. Those whom I love, I reprimand. I punish. 
Therefore, be zealous and repent. Remember, repent means change of mind. In this case, change your mind about your sin. Name your sin to God. Behold, I stand at the door and I keep knocking. It starts off with a light knock. And then it gets harder. And that's intensive discipline. And then he really tries to wake you up and get your attention and say, Buddy, there's nothing more important than the Word of God. Stop living in carnality and get with the Word of God. Behold, I stand at the door and I keep knocking. Warning discipline. If anyone hears my voice, that is rebound motivation from warning discipline. You hear the voice and you wake up one morning and you're in an awful lot of pain or things just aren't going right. So you hear the voice and you say, you know what, I need to have a change of mind. I need to rebound, get back to Bible class, learn the Word of God, change my mind. Take Bible doctrine from number 10 and put it to number 1. Change your mind. So if anyone hears my voice, this is a motivation to rebound. And he opens the door. This is the function of rebound, the functioning of naming your sins to God. I will enter face to face with him. So they get it from that because Jesus Christ will enter. Now it doesn't deal with salvation. This is dealing with restoration of fellowship. You see, before we are saved, we're spiritually dead. We can't invite Christ anywhere. After we're saved, we're spiritually alive. And when Christ knocks on the door, we can rebound and let him in. So you see, that's because now we're spiritually alive. Before, we were spiritually dead. We didn't have that capability. But through grace, now that we're spiritually alive, we have the capability to open the door and, as it were, invite Christ in. It would be as if on the hot days that we had last week, 96 degrees, a Christ knocking on the door and you just didn't rebound and left him outside in the heat. So you're punished. But then you rebound. It's the same as opening the door and letting Christ in to dine with you. Dining? What do human beings do when they dine together? Usually it's a time of fellowship in which people eat and drink and have social life. Dining. Well, it's fellowship with Jesus Christ. Fellowship with God through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And I will dine with him, that is, fellowship with God, through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, and he with me. This is the filling of God the Holy Spirit, which restores fellowship. And also you must follow up with use of Operation Z, that is, metabolization, perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. And if you follow up with these things... You're back in fellowship, and you have, as it were, invited Christ uh, back in to dine with you through the rebound technique. Impossible for you to do as an unbeliever. Impossible for anyone who is dead to do. So the means of salvation also. This is the broad way. You see, an invitation, inviting Christ into your heart, that's the broad way. That's the way most people go, and they're not saved. And you might know a lot of people who've simply invited Christ into their hearts, and if they've never believed in Christ, faith alone in Christ alone, they're not saved. And there's a lot of people in a lot of churches around here who sit in the pews every Sunday and they're not saved. They've never believed in Christ. So the means of salvation is also not a public acknowledgement of Christ as Savior. Now this is, comes from a distortion of Romans 10, 9 through 10. And you'll have someone bring up that verse. That we must acknowledge Christ as Lord in, or, in order to be saved. Well again, they don't know the simplicity of the English language. And they don't know cause and effect. Now, I remember I learned cause and effect in the third grade. And we had to uh, do worksheets. And it would say cause, effect. In, in one sentence, it might say a lightning bolt, or in half of the sentence. And then you would have to do the result. It might say, a lightning bolt hit my house. And then you would have to find the result. My house burned down. Cause, lightning bolt hit house. Result, house burned down. Third grade teaching. Yet when it comes to the spiritual life, they're blinded and they have a veil over them, their faces. So you say to them, look, when you believe in Christ, you will acknowledge Christ as Lord. Cause, believe in Christ. 
effect, you say Christ is Lord. Cause and effect. Dummy, go back to elementary school. It's, it gets irritating, but they can't see that. And you could talk to them that way, and the only thing they would do is get insulted. And they wouldn't even know what you were saying. There's a point in this. There's a point from the Greek language that says this. But even in the English, it's quite clear. You believe in Christ, you will acknowledge him as Lord. So it shows a great ignorance of English language and the relationship between cause and effect. And so people get confused. And confusion of means and result has given the wrong impression to many spiritually dead people. And they think the condition of salvation is to get up and acknowledge Christ as Lord. But I tell you, if they've never believed in Christ, and they go straight to the result or the effect, and they never go and they never fulfill the cause, the cause is believe in Christ. If they leave that part out and go straight to the effect, and just get up in church and say, I acknowledge Christ as Lord. How can you do that as a spiritually dead person? You cannot. You're dead. And you might do it with your mouth, and you might do it in the energy of your flesh, but you're still going to hell. Faith alone in Christ alone. And it's serious. It's very serious because you don't get the straight gospel It hardly very few places around this area. Every now and then they might slip up and get it right. But most of the time, it's invite Christ here. Make Christ Lord. Dedicate yourself. Do this, do that. It's a religion. It's not Christianity. So the Holy Spirit, in His ministry of efficacious grace, we have to understand this. God the Holy Spirit only makes faith alone in Christ alone effective for salvation. I've taught this before, but it didn't click. Hopefully this time, I'm teaching it in a way in which it's clicking. Efficacious. Oh, God, the Holy Spirit makes it efficacious. You don't. When you believe in Christ, you're not making it effective. God, the Holy Spirit is. And that's the only thing He makes effective. He does not make effective invite Christ into your heart. He does not make effective acknowledge Christ as Lord. You acknowledge Christ as Lord, you're not following the protocol. You're not following Scripture. And God, the Holy Spirit, rejects that from the spiritually dead person. Because God the Holy Spirit simply looks at the spiritually dead person and says, you're not capable to do those things. You're not capable to make Christ Lord because, first of all, you haven't believed it. And secondly, uh, Christ was Lord in the beginning. Uh, Christ was Lord in eternity past. He's Lord now. He'll be Lord forevermore. And you can't do that. How arrogant of you. I cannot make that effective for salvation. He cannot make arrogance effective for salvation. He can't, that would be compromising his perfect essence. If God the Holy Spirit were to look down and say, my, he has just uh, made Christ Lord. Well, well, first of all, God the Holy Spirit being perfect would say, what an arrogant ass. He has made Christ Lord. I have been with him in eternity past and he's always been Lord. He was Lord in eternity past. He's Lord now. He's Lord forever. And this human being, this depraved human being is trying to make Christ Lord? I can't accept that. And he doesn't. The only thing he accepts is faith alone in Christ alone. So utilization of verbal works, these things that I have listed... Such is comparable to the broad road, and it leads to destruction. Anybody who follows that path will go to hell. And there's a, a lot more people probably going to hell than we know. And we might think of them as believers. And hopefully, at some point, they did simply believe in Christ. But a lot of our friends that we've known in the past, if they've never come around to simply believing in Christ, uh, well, they could go to church every Sunday and go to prayer service. By the way, prayer service is, well, we'll make it uh, 545. I think we can shorten our prayers up. It, public prayer is supposed to be shorter. I made mine long today because I knew nobody would be here. But probably 545 on Sunday would be good enough to have a, a short prayer service before 6 o'clock. And then 7 o'clock, of course, the second service. Now, I know it's a change, and for some of you it may be irritating, but it really gives me a day off. Otherwise, I don't really have one. 
because uh, Saturday is the only time that I have, and usually I end up having to do something else anyway. It's not a complaint, I don't mind, but usually I have to do something uh, when I have a little extra time. So it's hard for me to uh, cram in my studying for two services on Sunday. And so uh, by putting it in the evening, it makes it easier on me. If it's harder on you, too bad. I'm the one communicating, and if I can't communicate it straight, you're not going to get anything out of it anyway. Besides, I'm pretty sure all of you are sitting here thinking, man, this is much better than Sunday morning. Of course it is. I'm awake. <laughs> so we also have another verbal word, commitment. Commitment salvation is closely related to verbal works, and this is putting the cart, the cart before the horse. And commitment confuses the salvation work of Jesus Christ on the cross with the believer's dedication. It's confusing the work of Christ on the cross with the believer's dedication. It's an unbeliever trying to be a believer. It's an unbeliever saying, I'll dedicate my life to the Lord. Well, you're spiritually dead. You can't do that. You have to believe in Christ first. Then you can dedicate your life, and what's that mean? Uh, simply making, and you can't do it in a one-shot decision. It is possible to dedicate your life to the Lord, but it's not a one-shot decision. It takes a decision every day, and that day that you don't make Bible doctrine, number one, is the day you haven't dedicated yourself to the Lord. Bible doctrine must always be number one, day in and day out. You can't be hodgepodge with the Word of God because those days you miss are those days you slip backwards. That is, of course, unless you get it on the Internet or MP3. It's none of my business whether you do or don't, but it is my business to, uh, re well, at least motivate you, reprove, correct, and also, well, as it says in Hebrews 10.25, to exhort. It's not the congregation's job to exhort you. And if somebody comes up to you and say, where were you yesterday? Well, they shouldn't be doing that. And you can tell them where to go. It's none of their business. But it's my job to exhort, to encourage, to motivate. And I don't know what you do on your free time, whether you get it again later. It's none of my business. But there definitely must be... Uh, uh, if we want to save this country, there's going to have to be a stronger fervor from the, for the Word of God. There's going to have to be uh, some uh, turnaround in your minds about what is number one in life. Now, I know we all have busy lives, me included. But, of course, I have the luxury to put the most wonderful thing as number one all the time. So commitment is a function that occurs after salvation, not before. And no one can say, I've committed myself to Christ and therefore I'm saved. You're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. So this is a confusion of Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1 was written to the believer, not the unbeliever. And what happens is, people take the entirety of Scripture. People try to take the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and they try to say, this is the means of salvation. Well, there are verses in there that are the means of salvation. But there's also a whole spiritual life to be discovered. So when it says, do not fornicate or flee fornication, well, you should. But it is not saying that if you don't flee fornication, you're not saved. Yet people will take that and say, it says flee fornication. And this person fornicated, they're not saved. No, that's for the believer. Unbelievers always live in sin, whether it be sexual or self-righteous. It doesn't really matter for them because they're not saved. And remember, when the unbeliever believes in Christ, no matter what they've done as an unbeliever. You know Jeffrey Dahmer? As an unbeliever, he committed many homosexual acts. As an unbeliever, he chopped people up, killed them, murdered them, and ate them. Stored them in his freezer and was a serial killer, and murdered I don't know how many, but a lot, and probably some that are still unaccounted for that he didn't take responsibility for. And right before he was murdered in prison, he believed in Christ. Guess where he is today? In heaven? That's something that's very difficult for the legalist to understand. They say, how could uh, someone like that go to heaven? Grace, you idiots! 
How are you going to go to heaven? You're a sinner too. Well, he had a different category of sins. Murder, an overt sin. Homosexuality, an overt sin. And he probably gossiped, maligned, and judged too, but he probably did it far less than a lot of these self-righteous people. And a lot of them are going to be burning in hell. And Jeffrey Dahmer's in heaven today because he believed in Christ, not because of who and what he is. And the guy who hung on the cross beside Christ, who was a thief his whole life, was nothing but a low-down, no-good so-and-so. And suddenly, he came to a change of mind and believed in Christ. Where is he? In heaven. Did he have a chance to do one work? No. It wouldn't have mattered anyway. That's not how you're saved. Not by works of righteousness, which we boast, but by the grace of God. Then we have lordship salvation. If you, the, if you do not make Christ Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. It's a stupid epigram that someone made up in the past. And the reason why, a Colonel Thame told this story in the past. The reason why he came up with this epigram was because he had a best friend. And his best friend had believed in Christ. And up until that point, he had always taught faith alone in Christ alone. Then his best friend went out and committed adultery. And it shocked him so badly, he had such terrible iconoclastic, arrogance, he made an icon out of his friend. And when his friend went out and committed adultery, he ripped him off the pedestal and said, you can't be saved and do that. And his friend said, I committed a sin, but yes, definitely, I'm still a saved. I'm still saved. And then he said, no, that's not possible. This is some fluke. I got to figure this out. And then later, he went to the congregation and said, you know what? He probably even mentioned the guy's sins. Who knows? But he said, you know what? Some people have uh, simply, uh, they say they believed in Christ, but they really didn't do it because they didn't make Christ Lord of all. So therefore, he's not Lord at all. And he came up with this stupid epigram, something that was derived out of iconoclastic arrogance. Something that was derived out of his sin nature. Something that came straight from the mouth of Satan, the cosmic system, in other words. Straight from his sin nature. Nothing to do with scripture. And people fell for this by the millions and still are falling for this today. And they still use this stupid, meaningless epigram. If he's not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. He's always Lord of all. Always, when you're an unbeliever, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. When you believe, he is Lord of all. When you fulfill the spiritual life, he is Lord of all. If you fail in the spiritual life, he is Lord of all. These are people who think the plan of God falls all apart because of their mistakes. God is above you. So this statement ignores completely the lordship of Christ as a result of the baptism of the Spirit. And Jesus Christ was Lord in eternity past. He's Lord now, and he will always be Lord. And of course, we have ritual works, and the Catholics especially get uh, heavily involved in the ritual works, and so do some of the others, such as, you must be baptized to be saved. And then they'll get into stupid arguments such as, if you do not, uh, well, you've only been sprinkled with water on the head, you're not saved. But I was dunked under water, therefore I am saved. So the issue becomes whether you have been dunked into water rather than whether you have believed in Christ. And it was, simple, it was simply a ritual. And we must note scripture. And I'm going to give you a list of scriptures here which straightens it all out. And you should never have a question about your salvation and from whence it came after you hear these verses. Romans chapter 3, 20 through 22. Because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's the title for the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So it's not by the works of the law. It's faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, period. Nothing there about invite. Nothing there about doing works. In fact, quite the opposite. Don't work for it. Believe. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. How are you justified? By faith. By works, no. By faith. Very simple. 
right there in plain English, Romans 4, 4, now to the one who works for salvation. His wages are not calculated on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. This cannot make it any clearer that when you work for salvation, you are going into debt. You're going farther away from salvation than closer to it. Here it is again. But to him, well, let's go for this. And now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are not calculated on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt, meaning Every time you work for salvation, you go deeper into debt, farther away from God. And the more you work for it, the more you gather up hardness of heart, the more you gather up scar tissue of the soul until you get to the point where the only thing you, the only way you think you can be saved is to weep tears of repentance like Esau did and he went to hell. So you accrue debt when you work for salvation. Romans 4.4 4. Romans 4, 5, right after that. But to him who does not work for salvation, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith receives credit for righteousness. What receives credit for righteousness? Faith. Not inviting Christ into the heart. Not making Christ Lord of all. Not commitment salvation. Not acknowledging Christ as Lord. Simple faith. Simple belief in Christ. And that, is, and that is for the one who does not work for salvation. But for the one who does work for salvation, you see, they could say, I believe in Christ, but at the same time be working for it. Guess what? It cancels it out. They're going farther into debt. There's only one way, faith alone in Christ alone. Romans 4.14 For if those who are by means of the law, that is, uh, keeping the law for their their salvation. For if those who are by means of the law are heirs, then faith has been made void and the promises have been canceled. In other words, if you could work for salvation, faith has been made void. So if you work for salvation and at the same time believe, it's canceled out, it's voided. It's like when you void a check and you say, I believed in Christ, I can write this check. But, you're, but then you say, I believe in Christ and I was baptized to be saved. And then God goes, void. It's voided. And that's what it says right here. For if those who by means of the law are heirs, that is, you are heirs of eternal life, then faith has been made void and the promises have been canceled. It couldn't be made any more clear. Galatians 2.16 Nevertheless, knowing that a person, this is a spiritually dead person, nevertheless, knowing that a spiritual dead person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. So I'm telling you right here this evening, that there are a lot of people who you might think are believers who are destined for hell, including many of my relatives, probably including many of your relatives. And they act holy, and they talk about Jesus, but they don't know him. They don't know what Jesus Christ did on the cross for them. I've heard them in conversation before, talking about, well... I'm so holy. This is basically what they said. I'm going to heaven because I never smoked. I never took a drink of wine. I never would uh, use a cuss word. I am so holy. I'm going to heaven because of me and because of the works I have done. And they've re they really believe that. And they go to church and they're called Christian, but they're not Lots of people can be called Christians but never believe in Christ and go to hell. And that's why we, that we saw Friday where we saw the fact that many people uh, will go before the Lord and say, But Lord, I prophesied in your name. Probably that prophet who came and visited us will get up and say, Lord, I prophesied in your name. And he's going to say, I do not know you. Get away from me. And they'll go to hell, and it's sad. He broke out in hives then, 
But it's going to be a whole lot worse in eternity if it, does, if it didn't wake him up. And it probably didn't. And it's a tragedy because and who wants to see anyone go through that torment? Not even the Father in heaven does. He says, I wish that everyone would be saved. So Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, we have salvation by emotion. We've noted that in the past. That is part of the broad road, the broad way of salvation. People think they're saved by getting a rosy glow. People think they're saved because they've spoken in tongues. They're all full of it, and they're going to hell. How you feel is inconsequential in salvation. There are corporate works which say, if I work around the church, I'm going to heaven. If that were the case of working around the church, well, all of us, well, most of us today, gain some brownie points. <laughs> but that's not how you get into heaven. Not by working around a church or doing some type of corporate work. It's not the narrow way of faith alone and Christ alone. And notice the words alone. That means narrow. Only one way. Faith alone and Christ alone. They're psychological works. This is something that is very prevalent today. Raising your hands. And people, this has happened even with the doctrinal pastors before who thought they had to compromise because they were in a foreign country and somebody got up and said, uh, well, if you've believed in Christ, raise your hands. The minute they do that, they've confused the issue for the hearers. And they might go home and say, I raised my hand and believed and was saved. No, you believed and were saved. So a lot of people think they can compromise that and get away with it. And a lot of people might be saved anyway, but I, I think I would have grabbed a hold of that nutcase and said, you don't know what you're doing. You're confusing the issue. And then I would make them all lower their hands and say, look, I don't care what you've done in your personal life. I'm simply giving you the gospel straight. It's faith alone in Christ alone. You don't have to raise your hand for anyone. Because it's a psychological work. And people feel good because they've raised their hands. Or people feel good because they've uh, walked forward. In, in, in the case of this church, uh, the front row would stand up and about just kneel right there. See, they didn't go as far as Brad would in the back row. So Brad would be really saved. He walked a long way to the altar. You see how stupid it is. It's all psychological. And that is not the way of salvation. So the point is, you are not saved by raising your hands during prayer. You're not saved by coming forward. You're not saved by walking an aisle. You're not saved by uh, weeping tears of repentance at the altar. You're not saved by making a public declaration of faith. You're not saved by whistling Dixie. You're not saved by singing Yankee Doodle Dandy. You're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And you might say, what do you mean by that? Well, it's all the same. If you've believed in Christ, whistle Dixie. Well, what's the difference? There's not a difference. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And Titus 3.5 says this. He saved us. This is Titus 3.5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, self-righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. His mercy includes efficacious grace. We can't have the washing of regeneration on our own. When we believe in Christ, we can't say, I believed in Christ, now I'm going to wash myself in regeneration. No, God the Holy Spirit takes care of all of that. That's what makes us so helpless, not only in salvation, but also in the spiritual life. All of it's been, all of it's been given by grace. So his mercy includes efficacious grace. And regeneration is the creation of a human spirit. Remember, when you are born into this world, you're spiritually dead and you're called dichotomous. You have a soul and a body. You don't have a human spirit. Because you don't have a human spirit, you cannot understand spiritual phenomena. Therefore, you cannot understand the gospel. And so God the Holy Spirit acts as your human spirit when you're an unbeliever. And it's all done for you in grace. He didn't have to, but he does. And then he makes faith alone in Christ alone efficacious. He doesn't have to, but he does. And you have nothing to do with that. 
He does it automatically from his own perfect wisdom. And then he imputes to you eternal life. You don't impute to yourself eternal life. You believed in Christ doesn't mean you've imputed to yourself eternal life. It means that God, what you've just done is allowed God to do all the work. When you believe in Christ, you've allowed God to do what he needs to do to save you. Before that, you reject him. And God is not going to force something on you that you reject. He's a gentleman. And he has to be uh, because of the angelic conflict. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of studying this portion of your word. May we, from these verses and from knowing uh, how to enter the narrow gate and what is the broad gate all about, may we come to see uh, just how gracious you are. And may grace uh, come into our stream of consciousness so that we can uh, realize just how helpless we are before you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.